Um, I'm Warren Hill, and I have a consultative practice in the southwestern United States, and a large part of what I do is I will power calculations for other physicians and anterior segment surgery for other physicians. have been doing this for almost 30 years. So what I'm going to talk about today, I'll start off, and I'm going to talk today about um, the toric IOL and um, how we use the LENSTAR to increase our accuracy. And just to start off with, the LENSTAR has been just an epiphany for us. And by way of background, we, we, we got the LENSTAR not for the keratometry, not for its use with the toric IOL, but for other things. We were doing some research and we needed a very accurate anterior chamber depth and lens thickness. And the keratometry completely took us by surprise. And it's since been one of the, one of the most important features of, of this instrument. So today we're going to talk about getting it right for the toric IOL and how we use the LENSTAR for that. And this is exclusively what we use right now. And by way of disclosure, these are the companies that I'm associated with. So um, let's back up just a little bit here. Okay, well, it's no surprise to anybody that the Toric IOL has become one of our most uh, popular platforms. And, you know, you, you can't throw a rock in, in, down in the exhibition area and not hit somebody that doesn't, doesn't sell a Toric IOL. This is just a small sampling of the Toric IOLs that are available, you know, around the world. In, in North America, we have fewer choices. Here in Europe, you have a, a kind of a dizzying array. So one of the biggest problems is what information do we use for the preoperative measurements? And I'm going to show you some information. I want you to take a look at the magnitude of astigmatism in the axis for all of these. So here's, here's one way we get information. This is the patient's refraction. This is against the rule of astigmatism about a diopter. This, is, um, this would be with the rule of astigmatism about two diopters. This is um, oblique astigmatism of about a little more than 0.75 diopters. Here we have with the rule of about three diopters. Here's some SIMKs, and it looks like this is probably against the rule. Now, isn't, would it be surprising for you to learn that all of these measurements were from the same person? And this is just a, a common problem we, we hear over and over again. And a question I get a lot is, what information do we use? If I have four devices and I get four different measurements, how do we know what is right and what isn't? Well, I'm reminded of that, that famous old story about the, uh, the six blind men who were asked by the king to describe an elephant. And, and each man asserted that the elephant had different characteristics. To the people with his, to the blind man with his hands on the leg, it was like a pillar. To the man with his hand on the ear, it was like a fan. And each person described the elephant differently, and they were perfectly honest and perfectly accurate, but they were looking at a different part of the elephant. And the king explains to them that you're all correct, but each one of you has looked at a different aspect of the elephant. And the same is true for the cornea. If we use different devices that measure different areas and employ different algorithms, it's no surprise to any of us that what we're going to get is different numbers. So to carry the analogy forward, you know, a group of ophthalmologists are saying, well, the simulated Ks, auto Ks, shine flow Ks, slit scanning Ks, manual Ks, ray tracing Ks, you know, they're all different. What do we use? Well, what we're doing is we're looking at different parts of the cornea, and this is especially true if you have asymmetric and irregular astigmatism, you're going to get different things. And each one of these devices is true, but it's looking at the cornea in a slightly different way. So back to the original question, how do we know what to use for the toric IOL? And every one of you in this room that's used the toric IOL has been faced with this conundrum. So we did a survey in the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery, and interestingly, 45 percent of surgeons overall are now using topography to determine the steep meridian. And this, this makes me feel very good because this is what we're going to talk about today. And for the power difference between meridians, 64% um, of people are using small zone autokeratometry. The majority are using the IOMaster just because that's the most common instrument. LENSTAR is, um, is coming up very quickly. And it's interesting to note that 40% of all biometry sales in North America are now LENSTAR. So it's come along. Now, why is it even more important to know how to do this correctly? Well, most of your patients are low astigmats. It's the high astigmat that we remember, but it's a low astigmat that walks through the door. And if you have a low astigmat, it's, it's more and more difficult to be able to determine the steep meridian because it's sort of soft, especially if you do it on um, manual keratometry. So here's a, here's a thing that comes up all along. These are I will master case. And if you look, all three of these measurements are exactly the same. But remember, astigmatism is a vector, which means it has both magnitude and direction. And here, the meridian, the steep meridian is different. And the question again comes up, how do you know which one is right? Because if you're off 
by 10 degrees. That's a 33% diminution in the toricity uh, correction. So if you have a T7, that's a, that's a one diopter error just built right in. So I'm a pilot, and what I, what I like to do is borrow things from other fields. There's no reason why we have to invent the wheel over and over again. And in aviation, they deal with the same problems of how do I know that this instrument's right and this instrument's wrong? And let's say you're flying along and you're in an Airbus here and we're, we're flying to London, and one of our instruments fails. We need some way to know that that instrument fails or else all of us are gonna have a really bad day in that airplane. So in aviation, we have a concept of what's called primary and secondary instrumentation. And I'm gonna share with you how we use primary and secondary instrumentation for the TORC IOL to know if we're correct. And the definition of a primary instrument is one where you know the information is correct if it's presented in a certain way. And a secondary instrument confirms. So here we are in the Airbus and we're flying along and we're, we're looking at something called a heading indicator, which is kind of like a compass. And we have secondary instruments. There's one called an attitude indicator and another called a turning bank indicator. And this is what we call the triangle of agreement. And if all three of these instruments agree, now we know where, where everything's correct. But if one of these instruments fails and the other two agree, it's probably the instrument that fails, I mean, that, that disagrees with the other two, that is incorrect. So using this philosophy borrowed from the commercial aviation world, we can go ahead and figure out some ways to measure the eye for the TORC eye well. So what is it we're looking to do? Well, we have to think like the TORC calculator. And the TORC calculator doesn't care if the Ks are 46 and 45, or 45 and 44. What it looks for is a one diopter difference. And it also cares about the direction. Again, if we have an angular error, we're gonna be off. So the two things we need to do is determine the orientation of the steep meridian and the power difference between meridians. That's all we have to do. And I'll let you in on a little secret. The Ks used to determine the spherical power of the IOL can be completely different than what you, you, what you put in the TORC calculator. Again, the TORC calculator doesn't care about the absolute value, it cares about the difference. So this is an insight into how the TORC calculators work. So here, here's how we get started. This is an axial power map, and what you see immediately is you see the, the two lobes of the astigmatism, they straddle the corneal vertex, and if we were to draw a line through the corneal vertex and through um, the two lobes, the center of the two lobes, and we see where that intersects the axis scale and the periphery, that can only be the steep meridian. It can't be anything else. By definition, this is the steep meridian. So this is totally different than just looking at numbers and hoping for the best. 90 degrees to that, if this is regular symmetrical astigmatism, that would be the flat meridian. So believe it or not, an, uh, an axial power map of a topographer is your primary instrument for the steep meridian, okay? Now, for the power difference between meridians, we use autokeratometry, but all autokeratometers are not created equal. What we need to do is make sure that the steep meridian on the autokeratometry lines up with what we got for the toric IOL, and that validates the steep meridian and it validates the keratometry. So now we have a method to know what our steep meridian is, and then we also have a method to know is the keratometry being measured in the correct way. So 92 degrees is what we had on the topographic map, and now we know that that power difference is probably be correct. This is a way to look at the information and know that it's correct every single time. So just to go through everything again, here's our axial power map. There's our steep meridian. There's our flat meridian. Here's our keratometry. And you notice the steep meridian keratometry lines up with what we know to be true from our primary instrumentation. And that's correct. And these, they, these are numbers you can use with tremendous confidence. Does anybody read Russian? Well, it's an old Russian proverb, okay? Trust but verify. So we, you know, we, just, we just don't get a set of Ks anymore and hope for the best. That just doesn't, that doesn't work. So let's talk about the different types of autokeratometers. This is the Owlmaster, and for spherical power, the Owlmaster has been an old and trusted friend for a long time. The Owlmaster was really never set up to do toric eye wells. And let me just show you what goes on behind the curtain with the Owlmaster. It has three measurement points above and three measurement points below the horizontal, and if we look at measurement number two, this is what we have. And you can see that we're measuring here and here, but iterating the steep meridian here. So again, we only have three points above and three points below using the convention of 180, zero, and 180. 
Now, if we look at um, how the software works, basically it's, it's something that looks a little bit like two sine waves. These are our measurement points. And then this is what the software comes up with as a steep and the flat meridian. The uh, power is over here. The meridian is down below where the power is the greatest. Drop down, there's the meridian. That's the steep axis and the flat axis. You can see there's a lot of blank points here. So there's a lot of iteration that has to take place. This is the LENSTAR, an example of higher density autokeratometry. We have a lot more measurements. In fact, we have two rings, one at 1.65 and one at 2.3 millimeters. So there's the outer ring, there's the inner ring. And if we look at measurement number one, this is the steep meridian and there's the flat meridian. And you can see there's not as much space in between. And if we look at how the, uh, kind of an approximation of how the software works, it's actually not quite like this, but this is just a schematic method. You can see we have a lot more points and there's less iteration that has to be done by the instrument. So higher density autokeratometry is much better suited to the, the process of the, using the toric IOL. Now the people at Hogstride added a T-cone, which is actually a topographer. So it's a, it's a Placido topographer, not unlike what you use with, say, the Zeiss Atlas topographer. It looks like this. And this was validated against the Zeiss Atlas topographer, and that's basically an industry standard. So the accuracy is within a quarter diopter of the topographer, and it has the right number of Placido rings. It measures a six millimeter area rather than a nine or 10 millimeter area. And the power values are accurate to, to within less than a quarter diopter for regular lens star keratometry. And so is the axis. So this is basically the best of both worlds. This is a topographic device that's as accurate as probably the most accurate case in the world. So this is a spectacular instrument. So this is what it gives us. So remember, this is with one button push. Now we also have uh, topographic information. We have Placido rings. We have an axial map. We have, a, um, um, we have elevation. And uh, all the things that a, that a normal topographic map gives you. The one in the lower left-hand corner is a tangential map. So here's what the axial map looks like. And this looks very much like the Atlas topographer, which is what we used for a lot of years. So here's, here's an example of somebody with very symmetrical, very regular astigmatism. There's the axial map. And then we just go through the exercise. Here's the axial map. There's the steep and the flat meridian. Here are our Ks. You can see that the, that the steep meridian lines up with what we know to be true, what we've manually validated. So the Ks are, act we know the Ks are gonna be correct. So again, here's Zeiss Atlas topography, and there's our steep and flat meridian, you know, just to repeat things. There's our keratometry, and we validate it. Now let's see what it looks like with the T-cone. There's a T-cone patient. You notice it looks exactly the same. So basically what you now have on the Atlas topographer, I mean the, 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 the Lenstar biometer, is the addition of a topographic map. So this is we like to kid around and say it's like a Swiss army knife. Basically, you have topography, you have biometry, you have keratometry, you have everything. Now, the next version of the software uh, is actually gonna have the ability to, to rotate this uh, caliper so you can do all this alignment yourself. We can do that a little bit right now, but I think the next version is just a little bit, even a little bit better. So here we have our axial topographic map superimposed on the eye, and then we have a caliper that we can move in different directions. There's also a tool that allows you to put in your surgically induced astigmatism. And how do we find out your surgically induced astigmatism? You can make up a number, which is what most people do. Um, you can also go to a, there's a tool that I've written on the internet. It's sia-calculator.com. It's a free tool. You go there and do a login and a password, and now you own your own database. And you can put in 60 cases or 60,000 cases, as many as you want. And it will sort by incision size, location, um, type, age, all kinds of things, and you can figure out what your surgically induced astigmatism is for superior incisions, superior temporal, temporal, 2.4 millimeters, 2.8 millimeters, and this is free. You can go ahead and, and go, to this, go to this site. So what are some of the things that influence surgically induced astigmatism? And when you, when you go to this site, you're going to notice there are going to be variations from one patient to the next, and the reason for that is that where the incision is located is going to determine how much astigmatism, surgically induced astigmatism you're gonna have. Also the architecture, certain types of incisions give more uh, surgically induced astigmatism than others. And then those of you who are physicists in the room remember that Laplace's law says that the effectiveness of an incision in a sphere is related to the radius, the thickness, and rigidity. So each person is unique and individual. And of course the folded diameter of the IOL 
passing through the incision. So it's not a bad idea to go ahead and determine your surgically induced astigmatism and then put this in the Hogstrike um, uh, Lenstar biometer. Now, again, part of this talk is about getting things right for the toric eye. Well, I should also mention the axial measurements of the Lenstar. You know, here we have the anterior cornea, posterior cornea, anterior lens, posterior lens, RPE, and um, the, uh, the pigment epithelium. This is, uh, this is a, a magnificent way to measure the axial length. So each eye compartment is measured individually. And not only is it measured individually, but the detail is amazing. This is the, this is the natural lens. Anybody know how thick the anterior capsule is? It's about 35 microns, isn't it? That's about six times thicker than a red blood cell. Posterior capsule is what? It's about five to seven microns. That's the same size as a red blood cell. We have a spike. We have an optical spike here. Not only that, but we can show the internal anatomy of the natural lens. So this is more than just a measurement. This is an incredibly accurate measurement that also gives us other information. And we'll just compare this to the, to the IOL master. It's a single global index of refraction that measures from the corneal vertex to the pigment epithelium, and that's it. That's the measurement. So the Lenstar is a completely different level of technology. This is the current form of the calculator, and uh, we're, the nice people at Hogstride are going to be adding Graham Barrett's calculator, and he'll be talking about that a little bit later on. The advantage of Graham Barrett's calculator is that it also adds the posterior corneal astigmatism that all of you know about now, so that that separate mental calculation doesn't have to be done. And that's especially accurate for patients who have against the rule and oblique astigmatism to make sure that the lens is lined up correctly. So this is some of the tools that we have on the, on the software for planning for the toric eye well. Here we uh, have our steep and flat meridians. And you can also do, you can play with the incision. So here we have just a temporal incision. It's showing that it's taking a, a, a T3 lens and we have 0.38 diopters of residual astigmatism. And if we were to go to one of the tools and just change the location of the incision using this incision optimizer, we, it shows that if we go to, uh, looks like it's 73 degrees, we, it now, we now need a T2, a lower power lens, and the residual astigmatism is zero. So we have this incision optimizer, this outcomes optimizer, that's on the Lenstar, which is just wonderful. And let's just go through this quickly. Okay, here's my favorite thing right here. Um, you also have the option with this image of the eye to mark anatomic landmarks. So here we have, um, let's see, we have, we have four landmarks. And these can be emissary vessels, areas of pigment, really anything you want. And now I no longer mark the eye in the holding area. A lot of people make a mark at six o'clock or at 180 and zero. Here what I do is I just bring this and I take my, my marking device and I line it up, say, with perhaps 168 and uh, 79 degrees, and then I mark the cornea. So there's, you never get lost in the OR. And it's a really awful feeling, isn't it, when, you're, when you sit down to do the case and all your marks are gone, and there may be some element of cyclorotation, you have no idea where you're supposed to be. This way you'll never ever get lost in the operating room. So in summary, um, the Lenstar with the, with the T-cone uh, provides a confirmatory axial map for the things that we really need to, to, to have. Manually determine the steep meridian and the power difference between meridians. And we, it's the, the biometer itself gives magnificent axial length and all the other axial measurements as well as the Ks to calculate the spherical power. Um, the, the, the Lenstar has very sophisticated formulas. It has access to the Holiday 2 formula via an HTML bridge from Dr. Holiday's uh, software. And soon, I think, the Barrett formula will be added as well. And we have an axial map that validates the steep meridian and then the power difference between. And this is the most accurate way to do it. This is the way we've been doing it for quite a while, and we, we've stopped having big surprises. Um, and the toric calculator is going to be changed soon to the Barrett calculator, which in my opinion is probably the most accurate calculator there is. So I, I just love this instrument. This is what we use now exclusively for the toric eye well, and in our hands it's been a tremendous success. Thank you very much.